Uh, it's a particular treat uh, to be hosting uh, Neil Ferguson. Uh, he is, as I'm sure many of you know, a, a British-born his historian who has managed not only to straddle uh, Britain and, and America with distinction, uh, but, but to amass a, a string of, of accomplishments uh, in both uh, academia uh, and uh, public media, uh, and now and then to um, stir up a bit of controversy. Uh, he, holds a, he holds a professorship at Harvard, as well as positions, uh, fe fellow positions at uh, uh, both Stanford and Oxford. Uh, he's written more than a dozen books on a range of hist historical uh, topics, ranging from uh, empire and, and war to economy and, and finance. Uh, and he's proven himself a talented biographer uh, on, on works about the Rothschild family and, and Sigmund Warburg. Uh, and there's, there's more. Uh, he has a film company that has produced several documentaries or, or series uh, featuring his work on TV, notably uh, PBS uh, here in, in the United States. Uh, and he's commented frequently in, in newspaper and, and magazine articles on current political and, and economic developments. Um, it was just over a decade ago that, um, uh, that Professor Ferguson was approached by Henry Kissinger about doing a, an authorized uh, biography. Uh, and he's here this evening to, to discuss the first installment of a planned two-volume work on the famous uh, controversial American statesman, uh, strategist, and, um, and scholar. This initial volume covers Kissinger up to, to 1968. Uh, just before the Nixon administration took office, uh, and, and so doesn't address a uh, number of the, the biggest controversies of Kissinger's diplomatic career. But it does delve deeply into Kissinger's intellectual development and, and makes the case that for a full assessment of the man, it's important to understand the thinker as well as the uh, diplomatic actor. Uh, certainly, Professor Ferguson had few illusions about what he was stepping uh, into by taking on this uh, uh, challenging bi biographical assignment. Uh, as he writes at the start of the book, no statesman in modern times has been as revered and then as reviled as Henry Kissinger. Uh, but, um, but Professor Ferguson has clearly thrown himself into the task, combing through a huge archive of uh, previously unavailable private papers. Uh, and the subtitle of this volume, The Idealist, uh, tells you right there uh, th that the conventional notion of Kissinger as the embodiment of Cold War realpolitik is going to be challenged. A number uh, of reviews uh, so far have uh, commended the book for its scholarship and engrossing narrative. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Neil Ferguson. Well, thank you very much indeed, Brad. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Washington. And, and I'd, I'd like to begin by paying tribute to, to you and, and all the other people who keep independent bookstores going in this country. Uh, it's a retro thing to write a book, especially one that's nearly 1,000 pages long. And there were certainly times during the writing of it when I thought, I'd become a kind of handloom weaver engaged in a hopelessly anachronistic activity that had been overtaken by the age of Twitter. But when you step out into the street and see a vibrant bookstore with real books in the windows and real people browsing through them, it rekindles your hope. Sorry, I said the word kindle. Uh, it <laughs> revives your hope that, uh, that this old-fashioned activity of printed words may still have a future. I'm not going to give you a, a long lecture because I'd rather have something more like a conversation. And we have a stack of questions that some of you have, have written down, which we're looking forward to get, getting to. What I'm going to do is tell you a bit about why I ended up uh, taking on this challenge, uh, which I initially declined. I'm going to talk a little bit about the story that I tell, the story of the first half of Henry Kissinger's life, almost exactly half, in fact. And then I want to say a bit about why I called it the idealist. 
And finally, a few words about what I've learned from it and what I hope uh, others would learn from reading it. When the idea was first suggested by Henry Kissinger that I write a biography of him, I have to admit that I, I hesitated and indeed at first said no. A, it just seemed like a tremendously difficult thing to do. The controversies were familiar. I was aware of the sheer volume of material that there would be. The generation of, of, of Kissinger produced a lot of paper and they recorded all their calls, or at least a lot of them. So I thought it, it'll be a mountain of stuff and no matter how thorough I am, there will be some people who will just, will just hate me and the book <laughs> without necessarily reading it, and that's going to be harrowing. So I said no, and, uh, and he then wrote me a wonderfully Henry Kissinger letter in which he said, oh, what a pity. Just as I'd made up my mind that you were the right person to do it, and just as I found 150 boxes that I thought I'd lost of letters and diaries, and I fell for that <laughs> completely. I thought, I'd, I'll go and have a look. No harm in having a look, is there? And uh, so I went and looked at these, uh, these documents that were at his home in Connecticut. And within minutes, I realized I had to do it because the documents were just so arresting. Just to give you a couple of examples, there was a letter to his parents from 1948, just after he'd come back uh, from occupied Germany. I suppose he was by then in his first year at Harvard, saying with extraordinary force how much he disagreed with their, their view of the world. To you, everything is, is black and white. But for me, there are shades of gray. Uh, the really difficult decisions, he writes, are, are, are agonies of the soul, choices between evils. Uh, this was kind of extraordinary stuff to find in the hand of a 25-year-old Kissinger. Then I rummaged around some more and I found an extraordinary two-page typescript with the heading, The Eternal Jew. That brought me up short. And that turned out to be reflections that he'd written down after witnessing the liberation of a concentration camp outside Hanover in 1945 at Arlem. It's a document so extraordinary that I, I've just reproduced it in full in the book. And then there was the diary of, of the trip to Vietnam in 1965, uh, which was completely gripping and startling because it became clear that on this rather hair-raising trip, which had involved flying around over Viet Cong-held territory, he had come to realize that the war could not be won and would have to be ended by diplomatic means in 1965. So really within a few hours of browsing through the material, I'd come round to the view that I really had to do it. The stuff was just too good and, and too surprising. But I... I made a very explicit uh, agreement with him, which is quoted in the book. Very like the agreement I made when I took on writing the history of the Rothschild family too many years ago for me to count them. And it was a simple agreement that if I was going to be given access to these private papers, I would not be constrained uh, in any way in what I wrote that I would be free to go to any other archive I liked and talk to anyone else I liked and write the book that I wanted to write in the spirit of, of Ranke, wie es eigentlich gewesen, as it actually was, or as it essentially was. My, my commitment was, I will try to get as close to the truth as I can, and you won't like it all, and you'll just have to live with that if you want me to do this. And the only 
exception to that rule that we, we agreed was that when it came to personal family matters, he should have some say over what could be quoted. And I, I wondered why that was at the time. Uh, and it turned out, when it came to the final writing, to relate to, to his first marriage. And uh, as a divorcee, I, I could understand why he might not want all of that quoted verbatim. In fact, there were only three quotes that he really couldn't quite bear to see in print. So in that sense, the, the term authorized is sometimes taken to mean uh, whitewashed or hagiographical, uh, but this is not. This, this is a book that really set out to get at the truth of something that is, in fact, really, really puzzling. There's a problem. And the problem is, not only why did Henry Kissinger become National Security Advisor and then Secretary of State, that in itself is, is puzzling enough when you consider that he was born in Furt, Franconia in 1923 and arrived in this country as a refugee from Nazism in 1938. For him to ascend to such a position uh, of power and influence is in itself historically a problem. One has to explain that. But there's a much bigger problem, and that is why, why has this man generated such extraordinary controversy? Why did he go from being super K appearing again and again on the cover of Newsweek and Time to being really uh, the most, I used the word reviled, and Brad quoted it, I think it's the right word, the most reviled statesman uh, in American history, accused of war crimes, uh, not only by Christopher Hitchens, but by others. And if not uh, accused of war crimes, then at least represented as being the personification of a kind of amoral realpolitik, realism in foreign policy that most Americans find hard to stomach. Whether they're on the right or the left, because one of the startling things about Kissinger's reputation is that he's been attacked from both sides of the political spectrum. So this is an important and, and challenging subject to write about. And I decided that the way to do it would be to divide the story at the halfway point and distinguish as clearly as I could between Kissinger the intellectual, the thinker, the writer, the academic, and then Kissinger the practitioner. This book takes the story up, in fact, to January 1969. I stop not to tantalize you, but because it is a natural break in the narrative. And I tell the first half of his life as, to use a German term, a, a Bildungsroman, a, a novel of, of his education, of his development, subdivide it into, into books within the book to try to explain how this man came to be formed and what his contribution to the theory of international relations actually was. I think the book can and maybe should be read as if uh, there is no second volume to come, as if there only was a, an intellectual Kissinger so that one can see him as he was seen at that extraordinary moment in December 1968 when his appointment was announced, which was a very, very surprising appointment given that his political career up until that point had been so closely identified with Nixon's rival within the Republican Party, Nelson Rockefeller. The story, let me very briefly summarize what you get in terms of narrative. The story is a, an American dream story at one level. It starts with the nightmare of growing up in a Germany of, of upheaval and then of dictatorship. 
Furt in Franconia is right next to Nuremberg, an absolute hotbed of the most vile Nazism, uh, the place where they published the magazine Der Stürmer. Uh, and Kissinger suffered uh, all the discrimination and harassment, including uh, violence uh, that Jews experienced growing up in 1930s Germany. They got out in the nick of time, just before the pogrom of Kristallnacht, uh, and they were able to get to the United States because his mother had a relative who, who vouched for them, which you had to get in order to be one of those who got a quota visa. Kissinger started all over again, having arrived here age 15. He studied nights. During the day, he worked in a, in a factory that made shaving brushes. Uh, he studied well, but there was no glimmer at that point uh, of his future. The expectation was maybe accountancy, something like that. And they lived a very modest life in Washington Heights uh, in a community composed increasingly, as others came, of, of people from that part of, of the world, South German Jews, many of them orthodox, as the Kissinger family was. His life took a dramatic second turn with conscription, with his service in World War II. And, and that's where the, the story of his education really takes a decisive step, because it was in the military that he met his great mentor, Fritz Kramer, another refugee from Nazism, who's one of the most colorful characters in the book, a sort of, I guess, Mephistopheles uh, to Kissinger's Faust. It was Kramer who saw uh, Kissinger's intellectual potential and encouraged him to think about philosophy, to think about history. And you have to imagine these two guys, both of whom were privates in the US Army, sort of tramping around miserable training camps in Louisiana and the like, talking about German philosophy and history. That relationship was an extraordinarily important one, and it's one of a succession of relationships that the book documents. Uh, he had mentors, uh, and each of these mentors gave him a, a, an important idea or set of ideas that changed the direction of his life. World War II and witnessing the Holocaust were searing experiences. Combat, he was in an extremely exposed position in the Battle of the Bulge under a heavy German shell fire. If he'd been taken prisoner, it would have been curtains. The Germans tended to shoot people who had originally been German, and especially if they were Jews. He then became a counterintelligence agent whose job was to hunt down uh, the hardened Nazis, which the American occupying forces believed needed to be purged from German uh, society. And so this young man in his early 20s, between 1945, 46, and into 47, is involved in this extraordinary process, the transformation, the attempted transformation of Germany into uh, what it would hoped would be a stable democracy. He stayed longer than he needed to. And the best sources for this time are, are some amazing letters that he wrote home uh, to his parents. Now, it's perhaps characteristic of, of the man that I only saw those letters a few months ago, at the very end of the process, when I thought I'd actually finished the book. And then I was handed this file which he'd held back because the letters were so revelatory and, and indeed so personal. These letters are some of the most extraordinary things I'm able to quote from in the book because they reveal how those experiences of war, uh, of occupation, of the Holocaust shaped this young man, changed him. He wrote back to his parents, I am different, I am not the same, I'm coming back changed. Uh, and how could you be surprised when he went to Furt after the end of the war, he found that none of, none of the Kissinger family who'd stayed in Germany had survived. His grandmother had died, probably on one of the death marches 
and none of his friends were left. So there's a kind of moment of, of extraordinary contrast when he goes from that world, the charnel house of post-war Germany, to Harvard University under the GI Bill and becomes an undergraduate. I spent quite a lot of time trying to understand better the history of the, the university where I teach to get the context right. It was a fascinating time uh, with all these young men returning from the war to, to try somehow to pick up the reins of civilian life. And it was at Harvard that he met an amazingly uh, bombastic southerner named William Yandel Elliot, who said, go and read Kant, which is the kind of thing you say to get rid of an undergraduate who's kind of <laughs> turned up saying, I am your tutee, oh, go away and read Kant. And you think, that'll get rid of him. But Kissinger went and read Kant and came back and ended up writing this enormous uh, and, and extremely unreadable senior thesis with the modest title, The Meaning of History. <laughs> From the meaning of history on, I try to engage with what he wrote. And I think I do it more thoroughly and more deeply than previous scholars. I take the time to get close to these texts because they are crucial to our understanding of, of his intellectual development. Part, therefore, of this story is the story of the birth of an intellectual, birth of an academic, of a young man who decides, I want to be a professor, who decides, I want to write a PhD dissertation, but who inexplicably decides to write about the Congress of Vienna. This was not a sexy subject in the early 1950s when everyone around him is into theories of economic growth or uh, political uh, scientific notions of, of democracy uh, or nuclear strategy and game theory. He embarks on an extraordinarily historical dissertation, uh, which most people are baffled by. Uh, when somebody tries, in fact, Eliot tries to get him a job at MIT, uh, Charles Kindleberger goes, a guy who works on, on Metternich and Castlery? <laughs> no thanks. So he, he took a very unexpected and unfashionable course. And what I try to explain in the book is why opting for that historical approach was so important. Kissinger, in the course of the, the next decades, as he went from being a graduate student to being a junior professor, ultimately to becoming a tenured professor, arrived at four important insights into the nature of foreign policy and international relations, which I want briefly to summarize, uh, as they seem to me essential to, to this, this first volume of the biography. The first is the idea that, that history matters. And it, it matters because, as he puts it very nicely, history is to states what character is to individuals. In other words, if you don't know the history of, say, Russia, how can you hope to understand a Russian counterparty in a negotiation? At a time when others in the United States were moving into an increasingly abstract and theoretical way of thinking about international relations, Kissinger emphasized the historical. You have to know the history because you can't understand the other side if you don't know where they're coming from historically. The second thing that he learned, which to me is a very important insight, is what he called the problem of conjecture. This is actually relevant to all kinds of decision-making, but I think uh, he had strategy, grand strategy, foreign policy in mind. The problem of conjecture is as follows. You have to take a decision. If you act, it has some short-term costs. But if you're successful in your action, you preempt some disaster. The problem about your action is that you will not get any thanks for preventing that disaster. People are not grateful for averted disasters. Whereas if you don't take that act with the costs 
if you just, as we say these days, kick the can down the road, you might get lucky. The bad thing might not happen. You might be fine. But you might not. You might be unlucky. The problem of conjecture is, is really nicely illustrated uh, with the example that Kissinger gives of 1938. He says the Western democracies had to decide whether Adolf Hitler was a genocidal maniac or just a regular German statesman. And the essence of the policy of appeasement was to assume that he was the latter and to take the line of least resistance. In a very interesting aside, Kissinger writes, the appeasers thought they were hard-headed realists in their policy. They found out they were wrong, and the cost was tens of millions of lives. This notion of the problem of conjecture is really important, I think, in, in how we assess any foreign policy decision. It's very easy to see the costs of a strategic decision. It's much harder to discern what was averted, what was avoided, what might have been. So the hypothetical is very important in Kissinger's thinking. He, and this is something I identify with, is always conscious of the counterfactual, the alternative scenario. The third thing that Kissinger came to realize as an academic, with only minimal policy experience, was that most choices in foreign policy are between evils. You don't get many really nice, easy options that are uh, ni nicely and neatly compatible with your uh, ideological or moral preconceptions. And he says very explicitly in the book Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy that it is a moral act to choose the lesser of two or more evils. The, third, the fourth um, insight that Kissinger arrived at, which came partly from writing a book about Bismarck that he never finished. He only ever published an article about Bismarck, but there's this whole unfinished book that I found in his papers, is that pure realism, a foreign policy that is based entirely on considerations of national interest and is decoupled from any morality, is not sustainable. And this brings me to the last point that I really want to emphasize before I shut up. Calling this book The Idealist was not just uh, my being provocative and contrarian. It became clear to me very early on that he had been misrepresented, at least as a thinker, uh, with terms like realist uh, or Machiavellian, a word that's sometimes used. He was, he was not those things. Uh, in fact, because of his his negative view of appeasement, his immersion in German idealism as, a, as an undergraduate and graduate, and his revulsion against historical materialism as a postgraduate, not only against Marxism-Leninism, which he genuinely uh, abhorred, but also against capitalist versions of economic materialism. Kissinger says very explicitly, we cannot win the Cold War simply by saying our economic system is more productive and our growth rate is higher. He argues that you would have to reject totalitarianism, even if it were economically superior, because it is the negation of freedom. And the idea of freedom is very central, not only to the meaning of history, but to much else that Kissinger wrote. He even gives one of his later books the title, The Necessity for Choice. In short, as I read my way through Kissinger's published and unpublished work, I came to realize that he had been uh, misrepresented, that it was much better and more truthful to realize that he was, in many respects, uh, an idealist. He was an idealist on practical issues. When it came to working for John F. Kennedy, which he did uh, briefly and rather unsuccessfully as an advisor, he disagreed bitterly with two things that Kennedy did that he regarded as pragmatic to the point of being dirty deals. The Berlin Wall, Kissinger regarded as a dreadful, a dreadful thing that the United States should not have tolerated. Ultimately, Kissinger believed in self-determination 
Woodrow Wilson's great ideal. He strongly favored German uh, reunification as long as it was on the basis of democracy and not on Soviet terms. When he discovered that the Cuban Missile Crisis had been ended with a deal, a secret deal involving the removal of American missiles from Turkey, he thought that was a, a sellout too. And when the issue came up about a country called South Vietnam, his initial response was, this is a case for self-determination. We need to protect this country and its people from communist takeover. So in the late 50s and early 60s, he broadly speaking went along with the, the view uh, that South Vietnam should be defended with American military assistance. That was the idealist. Not the scheming Machiavellian realist of, of previous works, but in some ways a rather naive, ingenuous academic struggling to come to grips with the realities of power. This Kissinger makes a series of dreadful blunders when he first enters the realm of power. He bungles his first press conference in a way that is highly comical. And then he does it again in Vietnam when the press corps more or less have him for breakfast. It's a Bildungsroman man in the sense that by the later chapters, he's beginning to understand better how much harder the world of practice is than the world of theory. And I think the unfinished Bismarck book is a key to understanding that transition. The realization, I think, that to get the United States out of Vietnam by diplomatic means would require more than ideals. It would require ingenuity. It would require a complex strategy that linked the United States' other strategic interests, its relationship with the Soviet Union, its non-relationship with China, to the fundamental problem of the bungled war in Vietnam. So the book ends with Kissinger shifting, changing, learning, and out of the confusion of the election of 1968, to his own amazement, being offered the job of national security advisor by a man he had repeatedly and sometimes publicly criticized and condemned as unfit for the presidency, Richard Nixon. It's a cliffhanger. It's almost a whodunit. How on earth did he get that job then? And I want to leave readers wondering, and how on earth will that job change this somewhat still idealistic professor? Uh, some of you, I'm sure, will want to ask questions about what came next. Uh, I'm very deliberately avoiding giving answers on things I'm still thinking about. So full disclosure as I conclude this talk, I'm in the early stages of thinking through and, and trying to master the material for volume two. If you want to ask me about Chile or Cambodia, I'll give you extremely incoherent uh, answers. I don't know. I don't even know what the second volume will be called. And if you think it's going to be called The Realist, let's face it, that's just too obvious. <laughs> so let me conclude by thanking you for coming uh, tonight uh, to hear my, my thoughts and uh, for the questions that you've posed, which I suppose I'm now going to have to answer. Thanks very much indeed. All right. Thank you. So, Neil, before we get to audience questions, let me squeeze in uh, uh, two or three quick ones of both process and, um, and substance. Uh, we were talking uh, before we came out about, um, as a biographer, having uh, uh, great access to uh, the person that you're, you're writing about, how it can be both a blessing and a curse, a blessing in the sense that you know, you, there's, there's, there's no, no pages missing. You know, you provided uh, all the information that, uh, that, that is out there, a curse in that you could um, become too, too sympathetic to, to your subject. So how, how d apart from the, the agreement that you had with Kissinger, uh, guaranteeing that the final work would be yours and yours alone, how, how did you guard from getting co-opted uh, by the man? Because he is, of course, famously charming and, and uh, could, could easily take in, take in uh, um, somebody. 
you, uh, you've had this experience yourself, Brad, as you should uh, perhaps remind the audience, having written a biography of, of Don Rumsfeld, uh, who can also occasionally be charming. Uh, <laughs> and if the charm doesn't work, he can wrestle you mentally uh, to the ground. It's, it's, Thanks for the plug. It's, uh, it's an extreme, and by the way, Rumsfeld is one of the most interesting characters for volume two because he's one of the very few people who gets the better of Kissinger mm. in the Beltway uh, wrestling match. I, uh, I had some of this uh, challenge when I was writing about the Rothschild family. I can remember early on in that process, I went for a meeting with some of the older members of the family and I'd begun writing the first chapters of the book. And this was stuff that dealt with the early 19th century. And in the middle of the meeting, uh, one of the members of the family said hesitantly, do you like us? <laughs> and I was absolutely thrown because it had never occurred to me to think of it in those terms. To me, it, it was a scholarly assignment, a daunting one, a massive material uh, in both that case and the history uh, of Henry Kissinger, dauntingly complex documents, some of them pretty hard to read. Uh, a whole set of, of previous literature that I felt was in some ways unsatisfactory. It's just, it's just a challenge, it's work. You don't really ask yourself, do I like them? Do I like him? I think it would be very hard to write a biography of somebody that you found boring. I actually once tried to write a, a history of the family, uh, the royal family, uh, the Saxe Coburg Gothas. In fact, I thought it would be good to do a sequel of the Rothschild book that looked at another great family that had come to be very powerful in Europe, but I had to give it up because I found their letters so boring. <laughs> it just all they talked about was hunting and one another's dreary you know, wedding plans. Uh, and I, I just kept falling asleep. I would go to the Royal Archives at Windsor and pass out. The key thing about Henry Kissinger was that uh, the material was all deeply interesting. And he is intellectually, even at, at 92, still one of the most dauntingly smart people I've ever met. Yes, he can be uh, charming. He can also be extremely difficult, as uh, would not surprise you. We had real ups and downs in the process of doing this book over, over 10 years, periods of near non-communication. Walter Isaacson predicted when I told him I was doing this, and Walter wrote a, a biography uh, of Kissinger some years ago, that it would end in irreparable breach at best. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it nearly did, I think, a couple of times, but, but in the end, uh, as far as I know, uh, he's, he's come round to the book. Uh, and I think mainly because he feels that the intellectual account, the, the account of his, his, his writing is, is a good one. He's still very uneasy about the more personal things that, that are in there. There, there, there. there is some news in this book, I mean, apart from the, the, the general notion of Kissinger is an intellectual idealist. I mean, they're, 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 you do go back and, and revisit some, some things that have been reported and re-reported and take a, have a different take on it. For instance, the role in the, in the, during the 68 election yeah. of Kissinger allegedly um, trying to stall the peace talks. Um, do you want to summarize what, you've, what you found? It's, a, it's a, an argument that goes back to Seymour Hirsch and, and Christopher Hitchens used it, uh, it too. It's, it's, it's been around for a while that, that Kissinger uh, betrayed confidential intelligence about the, the Paris negotiations that were going on to try to end the, uh, the Vietnam War to Nixon's campaign, uh, that Nixon was then able to use that information uh, in, the, in the campaign and that the reward for doing this was the job. And this is one of those stories that, that is very compelling because it has a kind of, uh, it has a sort of logic to it. It's just that it doesn't really stand up to close scrutiny. It's, it's not there in the, in the documents. It, it, it really owes an awful lot to testimony after the fact of, uh, of people who had grudges against Kissinger, not least Richard Allen, who thought the job was going to be his. Uh, and, and Allen's testimony is very important about uh, and, and very suspect, I think. 
there's also a logical problem. It wasn't that there were any real secrets to, to betray, uh, certainly none that Kissinger had access to. He'd been very involved in negotiations in Paris to try to end the war in 1967. I mean, he'd effectively been working for the Johnson administration then. By 1968, he, he really was out of the loop. Uh, and although he went to Paris and, and met with uh, Harriman, who was uh, in charge of the negotiations, that there's no evidence that he had any confidential information from Harriman beyond Harriman's instructions, which were not secret. Uh, and Nixon, uh, in his memoirs, uh, uh, notes that. There was a source within the administration who did get information uh, to the Nixon camp, but it wasn't Kissinger. Mm. In fact, we don't quite know who it was. Uh, Kissinger uh, was only one of a great many people that the Nixon campaign was tapping. And Kissinger was used to being tapped by campaigns. In 1960, he'd been advising Rockefeller, and then Kennedy had come along and said, will you come and work for me? He'd gone to Rockefeller and said, can I do this? Rockefeller had said yes. It was more or less the same story in 68. Uh, Hubert Humphrey consulted him, so did, so did the Nixon camp. He went to Rockefeller and he said, what do you think? So I, I've delved as deeply as I can into this, and I can't find anything remotely like a smoking gun. On the contrary, I think the story falls apart when you, when you A, dig into the documents, and B, just ask yourself, was there in fact something that he could have done that would have been so significant? The truth is, everybody knew what was going on. It was absolutely clear that Johnson wanted to spring an October surprise. You only had to read the papers to see that. Uh, so even uh, if Kissinger had never so much as exchanged a word with members of the Nixon campaign, I don't think it would have made a difference. He clearly offered his analysis, but he was, he was used to doing that and used to being consulted in that way. Um, so one audience question I have here uh, says, a few men in public life were as attentive to their public image, their legacy, as Henry Kissinger. Do you know that the documents you were given uh, were complete and accurate? Well, no archive, uh, by in at least my experience, is complete. You, you have to assume that, that things don't all survive, whether through happenstance or, or through weeding. Um, I don't think there was much weeding done uh, by Kissinger. The archive wasn't, A, that well organized. B, there were lots of things in it. That if he had weeded, he would have weeded out. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, the private papers are, are a pretty good source, certainly uh, for this first half of his life. Even if they're not, remember, it's only one of the archives that I used. For both volumes, I think I've now got material from 111 archives. In volume one, 50 archives are, are, are there in the back. Um, I've, I've been taking my time over this for a good reason. And that reason is that if you're studying the international man of mystery, you need to study him from multiple vantage points, not only from the US vantage point, uh, but also from, from foreign uh, governments and, and foreign uh, individuals vantage points. So I went through a pretty elaborate process of triangulation to try to make sure that the story's checked out that, for example, what he wrote about his Vietnam trip was corroborated by uh, what was coming from the State Department's official uh, embassy reports. Uh, and, and by and large, it turned out that Kissinger's reports of meetings were better than the reports sent by the professional diplomats, more detailed, richer. Uh, I tried to look at the negotiations that he was involved in uh, by looking also at, at foreign archives, the Polish archives, for example. So I think the best way to feel confident that you're doing your job as a, as a historian thoroughly is to be pretty exhaustive about it and make sure that you've, you've left no stone unturned. That's been my approach, and it's why it's taken, it's why it's taken so long. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. Why did President Nixon appoint Henry Kissinger as National Security Advisor and later Secretary of State, even though Kissinger previously supported Nelson Rockefeller for president? Yeah, they were a pretty unlikely combination. Um, so unlikely that Kissinger didn't realize Nixon had offered him the job the first time he offered him the job. Uh, it's a fascinating story, a, a bit of a mystery. That there's, um, there's a good one-liner about this. Guido Goldman, uh, who was one of, of Kissinger's doctoral students at Harvard, uh, 
uh, told me uh, in an interview that, uh, and I quote, Henry was the only thing of Nelson's that Nixon could afford, <laughs> which is a great line. <laughs> If you, if you imagine uh, Nixon with all his resentments towards the wealthy playboy uh, Rockefeller thinking of this wonderful coup, taking his, his brainiest advisor, it begins to make a little more sense. But obviously that's not a sufficient explanation. I, I, I certainly don't think there was some kind of dirty deal uh, done. The job would have been far too big a payoff for a mere bit of, uh, for a mere leak. I mean, you don't, you don't buy leaks by giving people jobs that, at that level. It, it makes more sense when you st start to reflect on, on Nixon's own personality. Nixon did not really like meeting people much. He was, for a politician, bizarrely misanthropic. Uh, his entire life was really a kind of massive act of, of repression of his own desire to avoid people, which is not a normal trait in a politician. So he'd never really uh, had much to do with Kissinger. Uh, and Kissinger had avoided him on the uh, rare occasions when they had reached out to one another. I've got all the sort of minimal traces of this relationship. Kissinger would invite him to come to Harvard to speak at the international seminar, at some other seminar, and Nixon would not show up. And then Nixon, on one occasion, seeks to get Kissinger's advice, and Kissinger immediately invents a trip to Japan to avoid meeting him. He disliked Nixon. He said publicly that he disliked him. So this is a wonderful mystery that can only be solved by realizing that Nixon read Kissinger. He read uh, quite a lot of what Kissinger published, beginning with nuclear weapons and foreign policy in 1957 when Nixon was vice president. And Nixon formed the view that Kissinger was not only intellectually formidable, but on his wavelength when it came to foreign policy mm. uh, and strategy. And I think that that was a very interesting insight. Uh, you can find the, the point of convergence uh, probably most obviously in the case of policy towards China. In the late 60s, they both have the same thought that the split between the Soviets and the Chinese, the, the war that broke out on the border, was an opportunity for American foreign policy. Uh, there'll be an endless argument about who had this idea first. At least there has been. I've, I've actually got the answer. It was neither of them. The idea was given to Kissinger, and I think maybe also to Nixon, by a Czech named Antonin Snyderich uh, in late 67, early 68, i.e. when the Prague Spring was getting going. This man Snyderich, who was a Czech communist, probably a spy, though he was running an international relations center, met with Kissinger in Prague uh, in the aftermath of one of those pugwash conferences that scientists from the Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc would attend. And Snyder explains to Kissinger, look, you don't realize it, but you're going to be able to do a deal with Mao because the Soviets hate Mao. And it'll be like, it, it'll be like the Nazi-Soviet pact. It'll be the great surprise, diplomatic surprise when the US does a deal with the Chinese at the expense of the Russians. And, and, and Kissinger's completely incredulous. I mean, he dismisses the ideas as science fiction. I think Nixon had heard, heard the same story because he went to Prague separately around the same time, though I can't prove it. So there was a convergence of thinking, of strategic thinking. Uh, and I think that explains why Nixon appointed him. There's one other point to make. In appointing a professor, I think Nixon thought he was appointing somebody who would be a clearly subordinate figure, who would do his bidding. Uh, and I think in that sense, Nixon underestimated Kissinger. Uh, but, but in the initial period uh, of 69, certainly into 70, I think I'll, I'll be able to show in, in volume two, Kissinger was very much the junior partner. Uh, and much of his thinking and much of the decision-making was Nixon's. He was president, after all. That's a pretty powerful job. Mm -hmm. um, how would you reconcile Kissinger's Westphalian conception of world order with the world of today, where there are failing states, uh, supranational or organizations, increasingly powerful multinational corporations, and non-state actors, such as ISIS and the Taliban? 
It's a great question. Uh, it's a question that he himself has, has tried to address in his most recent book, World Order, uh, essentially by saying that that Westphalian order, at least in Europe, is in, in decay, and that rival orders uh, are challenging it, creating, I think, uh, in his eyes, a very unstable world. Uh, and, and you would think as you, as you read this book, ah, I bet this is the first time uh, the old man has thought about the importance of technology and globalization. You'd be quite wrong. Uh, these themes are there in his writing in the 1960s. Uh, I came across an extraordinary uh, document about the, in, the significance of computers uh, for foreign policy making, uh, written in 1968, uh, arguing that until there's proper data management, the federal government will be incapable of making uh, good, uh, good foreign policy. So Kissinger writes in the 1960s about precisely these themes. He says, we're entering a new age of interdependence. The word globalization hadn't come in then, but interdependence was really the term that was, that was used. It's a, it's a world in which states are less powerful and are less capable of acting as they did uh, in the 19th century, and, and therefore the Westphalian rules no longer apply, uh, or at least they're less, they're less compelling and less binding than, than they had been. And although we are accustomed to Islamic extremists and networks of, of non-state terror or terrorism, in the late 1960s, uh, though the ideology was different, there were clearly threats, uh, mostly from the left, but also from, from, uh, from radical nationalists that had much in common, at least in their tactics, uh, with today's terrorists. Well, the technology is different today. We all are familiar with that. But what's st really striking to me is that when you go back and look at the 1960s, Kissinger is already seeing that globalization and uh, technology are going to change the international order. And part of the problem, as he saw it by the late 1960s, was precisely that it would be really hard to do foreign policy in such a, in such a world of, of turmoil. Remember, the 1970s were a vastly more violent decade than our time until really quite recently. There was probably in the neighborhood of two and a half million uh, fatalities due to armed conflict in the 1970s, well, around the world. There were a lot of pretty big wars and they were quite widely distributed. In the 2000s, sort of 2000 to 2010 really, uh, it was an order of magnitude less, probably 250,000. Uh, we lived through a time of remarkable peace. I think it's ending, I think it's probably been ending since the Syrian civil war began. Uh, but Kissinger's entering a time, he enters government at a time of great turmoil. Uh, and therefore, many of the themes that your question are raised were already m very present in his mind even then. We, we have time for, for, for one more question, although um, may, maybe you, you want to wait for volume two to fully answer this one. But wh what is Dr. Uh, Kissinger's lasting impact on U.S. foreign policy? Did the neoconservatives defeat Kissinger's realism? That is, that is a great question. It's one of the central questions of volume two. I, I would put it like this. Was detente, that, that policy of trying to engage the Soviet Union uh, and br bring it into an international order as a non-revolutionary power, was that a wrong turning? Or was it a prelude to what ultimately happened uh, when Reagan and Gorbachev met at, at Reykjavik? Now, I, I said at the time I was standing at the podium that my mind is not made up about any Volume 2 issue. What I do have are the questions. I think there's a really, really interesting question to be asked about the critique uh, of detente that was made uh, by the likes of, uh, of Scoop Jackson and how far what then became the, the neoconservative critique uh, was right. Certainly, it's not clear that you could have taken a hard line with the Soviet Union successfully in the early 1970s. The position of the United States in the early 1970s was so weak that that, that simply wouldn't have been an option. By the time Reagan becomes president, a lot, a lot has changed. Uh, 
And my question is really, how far did Reagan's critique of Kissinger, and it was very explicit, I mean, Reagan frequently criticized detente, ultimately give way uh, to imitation? And I think the reality is that Reagan ended up pursuing detente uh, more than he had than, than he pursued a hardline uh, confrontational stance, and in that sense, I think K Kissinger's influence was enduring. It's a paradox. Kissinger has been consulted by every president since Eisenhower, not much by this president, though he's not been totally ignored. So his influence has been there in the sense that they they not only listen to him, but clearly presidents since Ford have used Kissinger uh, to maintain through back channels and then other channels contacts with, with important foreign governments. So he's been influential despite the fact that he hasn't been in office uh, since uh, the end of the Ford administration. Has value too got to deal with that 40 year period or so after he he left the Nixon administration. Yes, the aim of the book is to be is to be a complete life. I think it will be it'd be hard to write that, uh, partly because the the history of Kissinger Associates is really hard to write, and mm -hmm. I don't think there's much of an archive to have access to there. By all accounts, there's not great documentation. So that that might be a that might be a challenge. I haven't really resolved how best to address that. But I think what I can do is show that his influence continued. And I can also ask the question, did his ideas continue to have influence? Because that's, that's a somewhat different question. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope this, this answer gives you at least some appetite uh, to, read, to read this, this uh, coming second volume. Uh, and maybe um, you can send suggestions on postcards of what the subtitles should be. Uh, now, for, now, for those uh, who want more from you, after reading this about Kissinger, but don't want to wait for volume two, there is the, 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 the documentary that you did That's a few right. years ago. Is that, is that obtainable? I think it is. I mean, I should probably have checked that before coming here. I think you can get the DVD of Kissinger, which was financed by National Geographic and broadcast by them, uh, but made now a few years ago, based on the interviews that I, I did with him. I, I did a lot of interviewing up front on the principle that you never know um, how long uh, your subject's going to be uh, around. I've now come to realize <laughs> that Henry Kissinger will probably live to be 120 and do the memorial address at my funeral. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that led to a lot of interviews relatively early on in the process, which I, I thought it would be good to film for posterity, for other scholars, really. And, and because although there are a great many interviews that, say, Charlie Rose has done with, with Kissinger, they're nearly always on the hot topics of the day. Mm. Uh, and in that sense, they are, are, are interesting but a little ephemeral. I spent those, those interview days asking him about, I suppose, big questions of, of, uh, of the theory of, of strategy, of the, the philosophy of, of, of history, uh, as well as questions about uh, the hot, the hot topics of the 1970s, including even Chile and Cambodia. So we, we made a film that mostly deals with the period of, of his time in government, and uh, he hated it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, so maybe all the more reason for, uh, <laughs> for people to go for you. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I think now the plan is for you to go yeah. out front here and sign some books. Uh, so, uh, if any of you interested, you can meet Professor Ferguson uh, out there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Indeed.